Right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Nick Freeman. I'm the owner of uh, Nick Freeman Photography, original name I know. Um, I'm a primarily um, a branding, uh, branding editorial uh, portrait and headshot photographer um, based in the East Midlands. Um, I'm originally a Leicester boy, um, brought up on, on the Narborough Road, lived on there for the first 21 years of my life. Um, and um, our photography has taken me all over the world, some nice places, some very not nice places. And um, I didn't really think about my connection with fashion until I was approached um, to, to do this presentation. And having thought about it, my I never really thought about it. My mum was a model as a kid. So I was spent a lot of my time in changing rooms and waiting rooms um, at hotels while, uh, while things, uh, um, while, while models were changing and, and the like. And then in later life, my mum, one of her major contracts was Peck Socks, which I believe they had a um, units on Westbridge, um, Westbridge and where was it, what, Elston Road. Um, which uh, obviously was a um, a long time ago now, because um, I think they've they've moved away and are in different places around the um, um, around the globe now. Even uh, right, I just sorry, I think somebody's just in the waiting room there. I'll just admit somebody else. Here we go. Hopefully they're there. There, yep, yeah, that's good. Right, so starting oops sorry got a few technical issues there we go um <clears throat> excuse me let's uh, let's start off initially we're going to start off with the obligatory um high energy um high energy video clip so uh, let's get that out of the way before we um we go any further if technology will allow me it doesn't want to allow me why is that not letting me do that there we go <laughs> Okay, so um, today I'm going to break down the presentation into sort of three sections. Um, there's the pre-shoot preparation and planning, the actual shoot itself, and then the retouching aspect of things. Um, it's probably biased towards the prep and the shoot. Uh, the retouching is a fairly, um, fairly straightforward business, and um, um, there's a little video clip to show you just how simple it can be for you to, uh, to, to just put the finishing touches to an images without having to resort to Instagram filters. Uh, so the pre-shoot prep um, is going to be based around, and there could be a lot of these on here, the, um, other than the model, the hair and maker, the styling, the venue, um, garments, in, uh, uh, sort of all, all things that really... <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, do apologise. Um, um, yeah, we've got to uh, um, sort of talk about all of those things, the pros and cons for you, so that you can um, uh, get some ideas and tips and things that I've, things that I've, this is all from my experience. This is not, um, um, not things I've just read in the book or, or, or seen on YouTube. This is all from my experience, um, things that I've um, come across and dealt with and, uh, and had to, um, um, in some cases, have been, been problems, in some cases, just, um, um, just become a breeze and just become second nature. And the more you do it, the, the, the better it comes. So I'm a firm advocate in uh, learning from other people's mistakes. So the model. Okay, so pick someone who is age and style appropriate. I cannot begin to tell you the number of times I've been offered a teenage tattooed pierced model to shoot garments designed for ladies in their 40s and 50s. Now, to me, that doesn't quite work. Um, you need to find a style and look for your uh, for your brand. So if that's the if your if your brand is uh, and your target audience is tattooed teens or teenagers in general um then great use a teenage model that's appropriate don't then try and stick her in a twin set because she's gonna look wrong 
Um, I know it's, it's probably sounds really obvious to some people, but you'd be amazed at the amount of people who don't follow that quite um, simple, um, simple um, sort of starting guide point. Sorry, somebody else I just need to let in. There we go. Okay. Um, professional amateur. Now that's 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 the big big question. Um, let's start with pros and cons for both really but professional models professional models should in theory make your life a lot easier um they come with experience um hopefully um and that will allow you to um um sorry uh, just more people wanted to join there let me get rid of that there we go um so um, yes, pros and cons. So um, they come with experience. That's that's often a good thing. They should be able to help you guide you through the session, especially if you're not confident with directing a model. Um, although at the same time, they should take direction if you need them to. Um, they should have an idea about how their uh, their hair, makeup, and their look. But you need to be very thorough with your vetting of the models because I've had models come and therefore quite serious roles and they've done some quite how can we call it questionable modeling shall we say and that doesn't necessarily fit them with my clients so that can be cause of problem um so you yeah, make sure you vet your models very thoroughly amateur models are great oh actually professional models you can pay quite a lot for a professional model um a full day rate three to five hundred pounds is not out of the way but again, you could be paying for quite a lot of experience in that. Um, so sometimes the money's worth it. Um, amateur model, usually work for coffee and food, in my experience. Um, so that keeps the cost down, which is good. However, they come with their own baggage in that they're often, if they're not an aspiring model, they'll often be um, quite insecure to their... Um, um insecure that they're doing the right job for you they want to do the best for you but often they're they're they're, they're worried that they're not doing that for you um so you need to sort of act as a sort of slight psychologist and just keep constantly assuring them reassuring them that they're they're doing a great job assuming they are doing a great job of course um if you are going to use a model or you need to use a model, consistency can be important. So you need to think long term. If, if this is a, just an acquaintance or a friend, will you be able to get them to come back and do another model session in a year's time? If it's a paid for model, chances are that won't be a problem. Um, but if you've got an amateur model, you know, it depends on your relationship with that person. If it's your sister or it's your, your brother or something, then chances are you're gonna, that's going to be fine unless you have a family falling out. But that, that's a rabbit hole for another time. Um, the thing also with, with amateur models, um, and I actually quite like working with amateur models because they're quite malleable, because they, they're eager to please. So as long as you're confident about directing them to how you want them to pose and do, then you've got a good starting point. Um, the, look at this. Um, actually, let's come back to that. We'll come back to that point I was going to make in a second. It's more prescient later on. The, hmm, sorry, mental block there. <laughs> um, the thing with amateur models as well, and this, we're going to talk about these other things in a second, is they, they'll often be able to do their own hair, their own makeup, but you need to um, be assured that they're going to do the right job for your brand um, the, the, the professional shouldn't be a problem they should be able to do their own hair and makeup and often will prefer to do their own makeup i've found um, we are going to come to hair and makeup as a separate issue in a moment because i prefer to work with a separate hair and makeup artist because they will do the look and give the look that i want for the end brand image um, whereas a model might not quite get it necessarily, but we will also come to another point slightly down further down the list um, when it comes to styling. Um, so once you've found your models, where do we go from here? Um, I should actually have said before we got to this point, really, um, 
you need to think as well about where the end where your product's going to be viewed is it going to be on your website is it going to be a social media um now i tend to sh i've tended to uh, put this presentation together in a way um more geared towards the e-commerce side of things rather than the editorial lifestyle type shots because i think most websites need the e-commerce look uh, first and then they can you can build around the uh, with the uh, lifestyle and, and editorial images as you progress on um so oh computer's frozen sorry i hope you can still hear me out there in the world of there we go so yes so your models come in all shapes and sizes all ages um we, you just have to find the the model that suits you and your brand now hair and makeup professional amateur um personally if it was me i'd always go professional um amateurs can usually do their hair well or they can do their makeup well i haven't found one who can do both yet um i have a small little group of i have three or four hairdressers who i can rely on in fact one of them is the model i'm using in, in one of these shoots um but even she'll admit she won't do she can't although she can do good makeup she's not she wouldn't she's not confident to do it professionally so you need to have that um have like a reserve of uh of little of people that you can draw on um in case you need to do that for for your hair and makeup um the makeup artists out there i've used um a number over the years and I have to say, if they do wedding makeup, they tend not to be quite as good as those that do makeup for um, for television and things like that. They tend to be the better, more consistent, quicker. Um, uh, not always. I have to say, not always. I mean, know a couple who are really good uh, wedding wedding makeup artists. Um, so I'm not casting aspersions on on anybody. Um, I've just, from my personal experience, if you can find somebody who's um, a dedicated um, makeup artist for the uh, for the uh, television world, then they tend to be better. Sadly, they tend to be a little bit more expensive as well. Not huge amounts. You know, you might be talking like 25-30% more expensive. Um, so with that in mind, collaborations are quite a good way of keeping your costs to a minimum. Because this whole presentation, what I wanted was to keep the costs um down for everybody so the whole point of this i think was because people are starting out and wanting to build extra content i then didn't want to say you've got to go out and spend thousands on lighting thousands on camera you've got to spend thousands on a photo shoot because you need to have professional hair and makeup and all the rest of it so collaborations are quite an interesting way of building things where you can um, get uh, get people to help you out, contribute, or, or even sometimes they'll they'll contribute towards the cost of, uh, of a shoot, um, or at the very least supply things to help you go along. Now with hair and makeup, um, if you you, know, you regularly get your hair cut, or um, or have your ladies if the, uh, you have your hair coiffured in whatever way, um, you probably know somebody who's a trainee um works at a salon you could approach those um with obviously the permission of the salon owner to see if they'd be interested in coming and doing something or even ask your hairdresser if they know a makeup artist they often do um ask around family and friends you'd be amazed how many people I, i've asked recently looking for looking for another makeup lady at short notice and happened to find it turns out one of my friends daughters is doing it and i had no idea until she um until we, we we talked about it um so yeah, so that's a good way of getting collaborations, but make sure when you're doing this, you're projecting what you want to your suppliers and to your model. Um, because if you don't, um, at the end of the day, it's only you to blame. Um, and also I'll put on there, be prepared to pay for services. Um, I think the last time I paid for um, hair and makeup combined, that was one lady who did both. I think I paid about 220, 30 pounds for a session. Um, and that was, that was all that was about eight hours that was in total. But she did multiple looks, uh, both hair and makeup. So 
for me, it was worthwhile expense. Um, my client was very happy with the end product. So it was, it was money well spent at the end of the day because I know that client will now return to me. Okay, so styling. Now I could have put this on first, um, but as I wrote them down, as I was putting these slides together, it's just sort of the order it came out in. Now Pinterest boards, these are amazing. I, I can't use enough Pinterest boards. I li quite literally have about 70 or 80 of them uh, on my Pinterest uh, account. Um, so very often things get lost in translation when you're trying to explain to a hairstylist what you would like to do here or what you'd like to do there. Um, if you can show them a picture, it's a lot more, um, you're a lot more guaranteed to get what you're asking for. Um, and the same goes with the makeup, um, but also as well, things like accessories and locations, um, especially if you're not going to shoot a, um, sort of on, against the plain background and, you, you know, you want sort of a particular look, you can ask people, you can show people images and say, do you know anywhere like this? You know, these are the sort of accessories I want. I want something that's like this, like that, like the other. Um, and by creating those Pinterest boards, you can show them very specifically what they want. And I, just, I can't. I can't, uh, um, I can't sing their praises more than I do. They, they are just without doubt the best thing for um, communications between, uh, between departments. So you're all on the same page. Um, and this is again, where collaborations work it working well. Now you might be that um, you design, um, let's say, I, I know one of you, I'm not sure if, is, if the lady's still in the room or not, but she designs, um, um boys clothes um so it might be that she does shirts and trousers but she doesn't do shoes belts hats jackets things that you know bags satchels things like that so if you can find other suppliers to help um they might be more than happy to contribute towards the cost of the day you know they might just buy the lunches yeah you know, but it's an expense that's not on your back then um and i say you, the e-commerce um back if you're shooting e-commerce you need to shoot it on a fairly plain background now i tend to shoot on uh, to make my backgrounds fairly gray um but a lot prefer to shoot against the white background which is absolutely fine um and uh, if you're shooting the location aspect of things just make sure your your backgrounds aren't too busy um, you don't want distracting things in the background, um, people walking through scenes and things like that, or very busy shop fronts or something like that it might just be too distracting for the for the viewer of the of the image. <clears throat> um, and also start your prep as far in advance as you can. Um, and the longer you can sort of plan things out and go through things the better success rate in my experience anyway i say all this is from my experience if you um, i'm sure there are people out there who can organize a shoot in a day but it's definitely not me so here we have a few sort of the, uh, these are pinterest boards i've put together for for um shoots i've done in in the past this was one i wanted a, a smoky eye look um and i knew of uh, cara delavine had um had done some and there's two or three images of her on there with the smoky eye look um there's also emma watson with smoky eyes and amber valetti and uma thurman so when i showed this to uh, the models because the, this was a shoot i was paying for out my own pocket um it was a personal project um i sort of said to the said to the the models would you be interested they said yes I said, this is the eye look can you do this and they're all like oh yes and without a question they all came out and said yes yes i can do a smoky eye that's fine so we uh, we had uh, lots of smoky eye uh, models over the course of a month um now a couple of the models have got uh, got very blunt fringes so the next look what i knew wasn't going to work for them but there's a few people i said yeah I, I like a wet look hair look and they all i to a person turned around and sort of gave me a frowny face and was like wet look so when i showed them this oh okay yeah we can do that that'll look great and it did it worked very well with the smoky eyes and the sort of slick back hair and the, the garments we had for them to wear so again it was um just by creating a board the little bit of confusion went away and um and everybody was on the same page the styling uh, really important um it's not just about sometimes about what the garment that they're wearing it's about trying to 
make it look real look like it's a lived in thing it's not a it's not just something that's been stuck on a clothes hanger almost so jewelry and bags and glasses and hair accessories and shoes <coughs> excuse me it all makes the image as a whole um sorry i think we just have somebody else joining here i'll just admit them just one second sorry apologies for that okay hi krishna hope you can hear us missed a little bit but there there is a catch-up facility later on um so going from style oops, going from styling let's have a look um ah oh, nails yes um i always give a sheet i send a sheet to to my models um in fact i'm, I'm if I remember, I will send it to them so it's, it can be included with the, um, uh, with, the, with, the with the video clips afterwards. It, it's a copy of, of what I sent to models just to give them an idea of what I expect of them on the day and what I expect them to look like and all, all the rest of it. Um, so uh, nails, I'm very much a, um, I'm very much a, Neat, neat and plain, simple, consistent nail. I, I'm not one for the big stiletto nails and the coffin nails or whatever they're called, or, or, or all the different looks. It's just, to me, that's it's almost a waste. Um, as long as they look neat, just in case they come in a picture and they don't look nibbled and chipping off paint and things like that. Okay, so we have the venue. Um, now, if you're gonna shoot e-commerce i'd recommend you do this um inside um now if you don't want to buy uh lighting of any sort you, there is we will we'll, we'll come on to lighting in the moment that's that's the next section um paper rolls are a really useful way of creating um creating a smooth seamless backdrop um it's they're they're relatively cheap, um, readily available um, online, delivered to your door. DPD man will have a fit, but you know that's his problem. Um, you do need a bit of space. That's the only trouble for them. Um, you need if you're going to use shoot full length bodies, you probably need to ideally have the um, I think this one that's two point seven meters wide there or thereabouts. You really need to have that one if you're going to shoot full lengths. You can possibly get away with one of the smaller ones, but you're going to struggle, especially if you're using um, a camera phone, a smartphone for, for that. Um, I reckon that I, you need a minimum of three metres by four metres um, to, to, to work in to, to do those sorts of photos. But the more space you've got, the better. Um, now it might be that some of you have got a lovely little studio space that you work in. If it's got lots of natural light, then fantastic. Go with that. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, if not, you'll see later on, I did some where we literally opened the roller shutter doors of where, I, where my studio is and we um, effectively shot some images on, on the loading bay. Um, <coughs> yeah, excuse me. Excuse me, I need a sip. Um, but also um with lighting if you're if you're using um, artificial lighting of any sort then um you you need to allow room for those at that as well um but yeah three 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 meters before meters i reckon you can just about work in that but the more room you can find the better so if you have a warehousey space or something like that or a big double garage something like that would be brilliant for for a photo shoot um locations start scouting for locations well in advance as much as anything in case you need to get some permissions um sometimes you need permissions to shoot here if you're going to shoot in gardens or something like that you'll probably need to have permissions um and also certain areas around you, you, you they don't like you doing commercial photography uh rutland water in particular is a local venue they don't like you doing commercial shoots there um without certainly without permission um so yeah so you there's there's lots of um lots of um lots of places you can go um you can shoot in the high street you can shoot um um sort of urbany sort of locations um 
just be wary of getting people in photos um because if you have people in photos if you're going to publish those photos technically you need to have their consent so it's not just the model's consent you need to have the consent of anybody else who might appear in a picture if they're recognizable so if you've just got their arms and their legs in say for example then and a bit of torso then you'll you're probably fine but if you've got their uh, sort of their face in the shot then you need to be wary that um they're not um um it's all right until you start making money off it and then they want a cut it's usually a very big cut um so yeah so that's sort of covers the venues really um oh paper rolls yes going back to the paper rolls um the other good thing about them is, although generally I tend to go with fairly neutrals like whites and greys and blacks, um, they do come in a myriad of colours. Um, I don't know how many is on there. There's quite a lot, though, and I'm sure that's not the full range. And of course, you will need a means of supporting that background role with a form of um, stands and and uh, pole poles to go go between the uh, the, the paper roll um they're they're quite cheap those background stand rolls but you do pay your money and takes your choice um i've had them for 25 quid and i've got three or four shoots out of them and they're just dis disintegrated um <coughs> excuse me yeah. sorry i've got 150. And this one more. So, yeah, so that's your paper rolls. Um, oops, keep going to do that. There we go. Now, garments. Now, this, this is your territory, really, but just a few pointers from a photographer's point of view that are things that have happened that people don't always think about. Um, making sure things are steamed, pressed, and lint free. Um, 50% of the people have come to my studio in the past, we've spent time having to press and steam stuff. So if you, even if you press and steam stuff, I know things can get created in transit, um, make sure that your studio, if you're using a studio or location that you've got, has got a steam available for you to use um, when you get there to make sure everything is as, um, as crease-free as possible, because it does make a big difference to the end images and it doesn't matter what camera you're using. Um, and your photographer will thank you because um, there are, there's a lot less Photoshop involved at the end of the day. Um, I have a I use I have a, a steam a steam um, steamer in my off in my studio that just sits there ready to go. It takes a few minutes to warm up and it's it, it's invaluable. In fact, the shoot that we did here, the dress was creased when when Jim packed it, so we'd steamed it, um, and it just made the the, the dress look so much nicer. Um, a big no-no is don't let your models sit in their garments um, when they're having their hair and makeup done because it, it makes them crease up. It's just one of those things people forget and they sit down and suddenly they've got creases um, around the hips. Um, and it just, that's it, it's gone. You've got to take the garment off, you've got to steam it, start again. And it's just time on your day that you probably won't have if you've got more than sort of three or four garments that you're photographing um and with that um produce a shoot plan um so which garment goes with which look first second third so on um it's useful if and probably the easiest way is to give you an example is if you if you're start you've got a range of of garments that you want to photograph from fairly leisurely right through to fairly formal you could start either way. You could start at the formal end and things to make sure that's done, dusted and out of the way, because that's the image that's going to go on all the um, all the marketing, all the branding. Um, so you want to get that one nailed and it can it takes as long as it takes to get the shots done. Um, or you could start the other way around and start with the leisurely stuff where the hair's just back in a ponytail. It's got minimal makeup. It's quite a fresh look um fresh relaxed look and you know both both your models are you know, can can start in the same way <coughs> excuse me um um so yeah so make sure you have a shot plan I, the times i've not used the shot plan for various reasons the days i've always got so out of control um because nobody necessarily knows what's happening at what time exactly it's a real big thing to make um it's a real simple thing to do and it makes a real big difference is what i'm trying to say um i'm i'm a big advocate for uh, for that um i don't think i've got anything else to really say about the 
garment aspect. No, the shoot. Okay, so uh, when it comes to shoots, um, everyone thinks it's all about the camera. It's not. It's about the lighting. That's the key to every good successful shoot, in my opinion. Lighting is 70% or more of the shoot. Cameras 10%, models 10%, 10% is everything else, including a little bit of look maybe. Um, and then location and background, which we've already touched on a little bit there, um, but we will just elaborate a little bit further on as we, as we go on. Okay, so your camera recording devices. As I said earlier, I wanted to make it as inclusive as possible. So. I wanted to, um, I think everybody these days has got a smartphone. Um, I think there's only a few, well, maybe drug dealers and, uh, and people who don't want, to, want you to know who they are, who don't have smartphones. Um, so you can do an awful lot with smartphones. The technology is just incredible what you can do with them. The results surprised me a, a lot um, as, we were, uh, as we were doing this shoot um, to the point well, I've done a comparison, which you'll see shortly, um, and I thought there would be not a nice sort of progressive learning curve for you guys as you sort of develop your abilities and skills um, with, with cameras and lighting and, and taking photos. Um, but actually, it's kind of, there's a, there's a middle step we could almost take out um, because the difference was so minimal um, overall. But you'll see that as we, as we go on a little bit further. Um, oh, that's one thing, yes. No flash. Take your flash off your phone when you um, <clears throat> they've got built in flashes, switch them off. You better working with the light that's around you than using on camera flash. Um, the second range of cameras that I, I shot with was a prosumer type camera. So that's sort of middle of the road. I think most households have probably got one somewhere or had one somewhere. I use my daughter's. Um, don't tell her, she'll have a fit. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's it's quite a good camera. Um, it's it's probably four or five years old now, but it's you know, nonetheless it's still quite a good camera, and it got yielded quite nice results. But well, you'll see the results shortly. Again, if it's got a flash on it, switch it off. The menus. I'm not going to. I'm not going to talk about how to use your camera. That isn't something I, there were so many that, and they're all different. I could never possibly um, explain everything in a week, yet alone an hour. Um, professional cameras, that's kind of there as the, the benchmark for you so that you can see, okay, this is what we aspire to, this is what we could have. Um, I'm not gonna talk about professional cameras beyond saying what you'll see as, as, as the comparisons come up. Um, good practice for cameras and recording. Give me camera level, don't tilt it up and down. Um, if, you, if you're not sure what I mean by this, if you point your um, smartphone or camera at a, a window or a, or a picture frame and then sort of tilt it up to the ceiling or down to the floor, you'll see the verticals of the picture frame or the window frame will tilt in or out. Um, what gets exaggerated, if you go above your model and point down and look at them from above, you'll end up with something like that. Big fat forehead. You don't want that look. It's not a good look. It wasn't even a good look for Helen Bonham Carter. And she's gorgeous. Um, so keep your camera on a level, tilt it, uh, pointed straight at, uh, at the subject. Um, so vertically, upright, horizontally, level. Um, if you can buy um, something to mount onto a, onto a light stand or a, or a tripod that will hold the camera steady in that position for the same time, that'd be great. It'll also give you more consistency. <coughs> Please apologize, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, so that will give you a lot more consistency over the range of fit pictures that you're gonna take during the course of the shoot. Um, and a personal bugbear of mine, and I see it all the time, and I shout at my friends all the time because they do it, and my wife does it as well, my kids do it, is you get a sticky fingerprint on the lens and they don't clean it off and you just get a blurry image. I know it sounds silly and sounds logical to clean your lens, but the amount of people that don't, so please, clean your lenses. Um, so, lighting. Okay, now this, is, this to me is the important part of, of, of what we're talking about today because... With 
it doesn't matter what recording device you're using, whether it costs £50,000 or £50 in a thrift shop, and you're having to stick film in it, if the light's bad, you're going to get bad images. Um, in my time as a, as a photojournalist, I, I like shadows. And you'll see that from any of my work. If any of you explore my website at any point, you'll see I'm a big advocate of shadows. And I was once taught, it's not just where you put the light that's important, it's where you don't put the light that's important. And I've carried that piece of advice through my photography career um, since I was about 20. Um, <coughs> so it's quite important um, to, um, to use the light to your best advantage. Um, now, for the purposes of this, natural light is going to mean daylight. Um, now, we've got, um, today we've got, well, here, I'm looking out my window now, it's quite bright, uh, and there's a few clouds sk skidding around. But the big problem with lighting in the UK, of course, is consistency. Um, one day it's bright and sunny, then it's dark and cloudy. But there's always light, so you can always use it um, and to get nice, nice images um i quite like a cloudy day for photography because the light is very even um bright sunshine is fine but i wouldn't recommend it somewhere you start taking photos if you can help it um if you're using um, natural light look for the shade especially if you're outside now if you're inside and you're using a big shutter door like i was and you'll see the images shortly um you can um you've got a lot of light coming through. If you've got like a patio door, something like that, lovely light coming through there. If um, I recently shot in a lovely old building and these really big, it's an old mill building and lovely big tall windows, great light shining through. It was really fantastic. Um, sorry, it's just somebody wants to join, I think. Oh no, we're okay. Some Ben got there before me, I think. Um, yes, so, um, so natural light. Natural light is lovely. I use it as whenever possible. I use natural light, but it isn't always possible. And when you want consistency across your images all the time, then you need to um, um, you need to maybe think about some artificial form of light. So going forward from there. Oh, come on, there we go. There ah, we go. So this, as I say, this was natural light. This was shot in the, this is where I rent my studio. And this is their downstairs. And they have big roller shutter doors where, which effectively is like having a, um, a big double garage door. And you can just see sort of the exterior. This was shot on my phone very quickly. Um, poor old Kerry on Blesser had been modeling for me for about eight hours at this point and was ready to collapse on me, I think. Um, but yeah, that's, um, oh, there we go. So these were three images taken with smartphone, prosumer camera. I think I think it was about 500 quid new, this camera, where it was new. and then my professional level camera. Um, it looks incredibly bright on my screen there. It didn't look that bright when I was editing them. Um, now, <clears throat> they all are quite acceptable. There's not a lot on this one between the prosumer and the professional, but what surprised me was how good the smartphone was. Um, the lighting's lovely. Um, Carrie Ann looks lovely. She's gorgeous. She models for me a lot. She's a tiny weeny little thing, so she's not the best model for a lot of clothing because she is only a size four, bless her. Um, and she's quite short, <laughs> but she's lovely. So if anybody ever needs a model, Tap me up. She's uh, she'll uh, she'd love to do it for you. Um, now, all the images are great for social media and for the website. There's this they they all hold up really well. Um, the only time the smartphone image falls down or starts to fall down is if you want to print, say, a catalog or go into a, like a full page advert or something like that in a magazine, because um, then the quality isn't quite as good. It's good, but it's not, I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't use it. I don't think it's quite good enough for that level. The prosumer probably is just about good enough. And the professional, obviously, is fine. Um, and that will print, in fact, the professional image would probably print to sort of A1 size, AO size even. 
um, quite happily before you start to get any um, any loss of quality. But my point I made earlier about whether it was um, a sort of like a progression, you'd start with the smartphone, then you'd perhaps progress to a prosumer and then to the professional. It's like, because actually you can almost just skip the prosumer, have another year of smartphone, save your money, and buy a professional camera if that's what you wanted to do. Of course, you could always go to a professional photographer. That's always the other option, of course. Um, so, yeah, so all, and incidentally, all those pictures I've done, apart from cropping them, um, I've done nothing to them at all. Just they're just straight out of camera, um, and they're they're balanced. They're um, they're fairly accurate actually on the color balance, um, which is something we'll talk about. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk technical stuff and, and bamboozle you when we get to the editing. It's it's all very straightforward. Um, these things reflectors. Now, if you're using um, natural light or if you're using um, um, uh, artificial light, then um, reflectors are key. I mean, you can see here is a slight demonstration as it lights the face on carry on. And we take it away and the face goes back into shadow. Now, this was an extreme example. We did this on purpose just to to show I wouldn't normally shoot quite that harsh, <laughs> but that was just to demonstrate the benefit of a reflector. Now, those reflectors. I think they're about 12 quid each on various auction sites and, and selling online selling sites. So they're not an expensive purchase um, and they are invaluable. I use them on probably every shoot I do. Um, somewhere in there, there's a reflector um, just to fill in a shadow or to put some extra light on the background or whatever it might be. Just they are invaluable and they come in lots of different sizes. I think that one in particular was, I think it's a 43 inch size one, rings a bell. Um, they're called five in one reflectors. They usually have like a black side, a white side, a silver side, a gold side, and then the middle core is usually translucent white, which is great if you don't want to put a lot of light in or if you want to block direct sunlight even, they're, they're very useful for that. If you've, uh, if your model stood in direct sun and you want to cast a shadow, um, but not put them in full shade, um, they're quite useful for that as well. Uh, and I say so cheap. Um, I think when I first bought one of those 30 years ago, they were like 50 quid. Um, there was one company in the world that made them and I think that they had a bit of a monopoly and kept the cost very high. So the next thing on our list is um, continuous artificial lighting. Now, they these come in lots of different guises. We've all seen these big, these are big Fresnel spotlights and like the ones that are on the background slide as well, um, synonymous with, um, with television and film. Um, I have a couple in the studio that I use occasionally if I want to create sort of like a sunlight effect or a harsh shadow. Um, which uh, I really like. That's kind of what, one of my looks that I do quite regularly. Um, but for you, probably not the right type of light. So here we have, and this was my bargain basement find. Um, these are um, continuous lights. They're, they have bulbs in the, these on the right, these sort of soft box things on the right hand side of the screen, which you'll see more when they turn around. Um, they have, um, I think they have five bulbs in them, um, which kick out about 100, I think the bulbs are about 100 watt each, something like that. So it's quite a lot of light there. They're fluorescent tube. You can actually have them, in fact, if we, can we go back? Oh, we can't go back on that, never mind. Can we play again? Yeah, play again. <clears throat> on the centre uh, of them, I'm not sure you can quite see, but you can actually put light, because the light is quite harsh. Um, but I just wanted to give you the maximum, show you the maximum power that these things can produce. They're about six feet away from Kerry Ann. And if I can pull, I'm not sure if I can pause this or not. There we go. You can't quite see there's some little tabs on here where you can put like internal baffles and these are uh, one that goes over the outside as well. Um, that, um, can soften the light and, and make it slightly more pleasing um, to uh, to skin if you've got a um, somebody who's perhaps uh, um, not got the best skin for whatever reason. 
Um, but I, I say I chose to keep them out. So here again, here's the comparison between the, the, the three uh, camera recording devices. So the smartphone on the left gave very acceptable results. It's slightly overexposed, but again, can be easily corrected either in the camera as you're taking the picture, because you can, um, I believe there's a little slide that you can use just to correct it. I'm rubbish, incidentally, with, with smartphone cameras. I try to avoid them at all costs if possible. Um, the prosumer camera did a pretty acceptable job. Um, and then the professional level one just was, you know, almost bang on straight out of camera. Um, the brilliant thing about this lighting setup is, this including postage and packaging, it only costs 70 quid um, from on online. I think it was eBay. Yeah. I think it was eBay. This one was. So yeah. So for seventy quid, you've got something that can light a full length, uh, full length model. Um, now there was two of those lights. Incidentally, one above the other. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just because one light would just wouldn't have been sufficient to. Can, what is this one? Yes. Yes. Toe, uh, head to toe. It's hopping. Um, Again, the same same principles apply with the there's with the um, natural lighting, the um, um, the professional it images just, will, will print very well, whereas the I smartphone will probably won't print as well, but will give acceptable results for social more more than acceptable results for social media and, and the like. Again, these were nothing. These images are nothing you know to write home about they're not not the greatest images ever shot but they're there to sort of uh demonstrate what what can be achieved uh now the next one these are these are my uh, leds in fact these are the ones i lights i use probably the most um i use these all the time in my studio for lighting models just small <coughs> excuse me um anything from um detail shots I use them. To, uh, I do a lot of uh, shoe photography, so I use them for lighting shoes. I use them for lighting um, uh, models. Um, in fact, I did an entire entire uh, book, which is available for purchase, um, <laughs> um, on um, shot with with these no flash at all. Shot with uh, these LEDs and the Fresnel lights, which are the ones to the you know on the background um, of the of the uh, slide here. Um, they're great, uh, they give a great result, but they are quite pricey. They're about £300 each, I think, but they're quite powerful. Um, I have a third one that I use occasionally on the background, but for consistency reasons, I didn't do that because I just wanted to show you how to light the model more than to how to light a set, because then you start to get into all sorts of different things. Um, so here's the comparison with the LEDs. Um, and this was one actually where the smartphone I didn't feel, feel did quite so well. Prosumer did quite well and the professional camera was just consistent across the board. Um, and consistency should be one of your watchwords, I think, when you're, when you're trying to do these things is to make sure it's repeatable. Um, sorry, I'll slurp again, sorry. Um, yeah, the um, keeping things consistent across all your platforms is very key to making a brand um so you need to find your style find your look and just go with that um if you stop chopping and changing people will, they will recognize you eventually but if they recognize a star i mean one person was as simple as they shot everything on a pink background all their stuff was shot on a pink background um and that became their thing that became their their brand away and then they started to put pink in their website as well and pink everywhere else and then pink became their thing um so yeah so it's you know it's 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 something you need to think about and and and, and plan for <laughs> ironically um again same same principles apply these are all straight out camera about no editing um the um actually i think the smartphone i might have cropped because um i'm really not very good with, with a smartphone it would appear um but all the rest were just straight out of the camera no editing at all now the other lighting and this is what i would generally use if i was on a fashion shoot for a client is flash and strobe now that's a professional strobe that picture there well actually it's not it's a, it's a prosumer one really but the only, the only thing I added to mine, which looks very similar to that, was I put a big translucent umbrella in front of this, uh, this, this central cone here. 
um, just to direct the light and to soften the light as it went onto the subject, because otherwise it would have been like midday sun in the uh, in the Mediterranean. It would just been too bright on the model and it wouldn't have worked. Of course, now we have um, we have to take out the uh, the, the smartphones because smartphones can't trigger the um, to trigger the flashes. I did have a look to see if there was any apps that were available, and I didn't find one. Doesn't mean they're not available. I didn't search the uh, the app store uh, Infinitum, but they um, I didn't find one um, straight away. Um, that uh, certainly one that worked anyway. Um, so this this test is literally the pro camera and the prosumer camera. Um, so. Um, because the other thing you need when it gets to this point is you need what's called the hot shoe on your camera. Um, now the hot shoe is this central part here with the little contact points in the middle. That is where your trigger goes. Um, now these triggers sit on that hot shoe. Um, triggers cost a fair bit of money really for what they are they're about i think the cheapest one there's about 60 quid and the most expensive ones a couple of hundred they all essentially do the same job um it's just the brand um and that sits on top and sends an electronic trigger to the flash unit which triggers the flash so you don't have basically have cables running this is when i started we had cables and we had line of sight triggers so the the flashes had to lined up in front of each other otherwise they wouldn't flash <coughs> excuse me um so they um yes flash triggers so um let's go on to the next one so here we have the the um comparison um so we have the prosumer on the left pressure on the right very little in it um i think just the only thing at the end of the day is that the one on the right would blow up a lot larger um they're both pretty good end products. Um, I'm biased towards a professional, so. <laughs> okay, so these, there's a couple of lighting diagrams for you. Um, certainly, I, the lighting diagrams, but they're starting points. This is where you have to, this is where you get the, the joy of playing around, taking photos. Um, and, um, um, it's the fun bit. It's, this is what I love. I love experimenting. Um, I, I often come home and my wife will say, so how did it go? I said, oh, it's great. Shoot went fine. Oh, I did this though. And, and, and that's the bit I'm more excited about. Not the fact that I've just photographed somebody famous maybe or something like that, but the fact that I experimented with the lighting trick just at the very end and it worked and it, we nailed it and it looks fantastic. Um, so the diagram on the left-hand side of the screen is basically what i use it's the reverse of what i use the, the, the flash was on or the lighting setup rather was on the on the right on the images i took whereas it's on the left here so that's literally all i did i had the light and the reflector just out of camera on the side um and it's very it's very uh, simple to use it's approximately a 45 degree angle round from from the subject from the camera um, and then uh, just the reflector on the opposite side just to fill in those shadows so they don't go really black. Um, the other option is if you like something that's not got, you want something a bit more even lit. Two lights, you do have to buy two lights obviously, um, and have them 45 degree angle towards the subject, um, just either side of the camera. Personally, I think that's a little bit close to the camera. I wouldn't have my flashes quite that close. I would probably have them um maybe sort of uh, two or three feet either side um but again at about a 45 degree angle to the subject and that would work lovely give you really good results they're quite classic looks um very simple to achieve um with minimal amounts of equipment um say those um 70 pound lights would easily replicate both those looks without any trouble at all um the other thing i should say as well on, on this I'm, I'm aware that some people are not producing full garments they're only producing maybe um hats or scarves or something like that so they don't necessarily need a shot that's going to uh, sorry equipment that's going to cover <clears throat> a full body because it's not um certainly not in the studio environment so you can literally just scale it down um just 
um, bring everything in closer and, and you can you get away with it smaller lights which often equates to cheaper but I don't think it's worth worrying about it if you're only spending 70 pound on those lights then you know that's that's yeah, that's a that's a minimal cost, um, but there are LED panel lights that are a lot smaller and a lot cheaper um, than the the ones that I have. Um, in fact, I've got I've got a couple here. In fact, there's one here. I'm not sure if I will blind you with with it. Um, you know, it's just just a small panel light here. I won't blind it straight into the camera, um, and they're very cheap. Um, less than no, it's about hundred pounds I think for those. Internal battery lasts for ages. Um, especially if you've not got them on full power. Um, so if you're shooting smaller things, you can get away with smaller lights and just bring them in nice and close and just out of frame. And same principles apply with cameras as well. You don't need to don't need to have that. In fact, actually, I would think probably a camera phone is probably better than in some cases even a professional camera. I've never I can't swear to it because I've not tested it. But having seen the results from what we've shot here. Um, then I think you, you know, very possibly that could be the case. <clears throat> um, lighting conclusions. Okay, color temperature. Now I haven't talked about color temperature, but all um, all light has a color temperature. It's measured in what's called kelvins, and daylight is is around five thousand five hundred, depending on time of day. But roughly speaking, that's what's generally considered the average for daylight. So you should try and achieve that in your editing afterwards. Don't worry, it's really it's simple. The, the computer does it, or the software does it for you. Um, so color temperatures are, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I'm sure we all remember those tungsten light bulbs from uh, childhoods or even, uh, well, even before then, I guess, um, that um, were very orange. That was a very warm light. So that Kelvin temperature is very low. It's in the 3000s. Um, if you go into the shade as well, that's very often very bluey light. Cameras are quite clever at being able to auto correct for it all. Um, some cameras are better than others. One of my cameras is absolutely rubbish when it comes to color temperature. Um, but I tend to only use it with flash anyway, so it doesn't really matter because flashlight is designed to mimic um, uh, daylight around 5,500 Kelvins, or give or take 100 Kelvins here or there. Um, and that brings me to the third point, and those switch off lights you definitely don't need in the environment you're working in. So if you're in your warehouse or something like that, or, or in your garage and you've got fluorescent tube lights, they tend to have a green hue to them. Um, so switch them off because you don't want the colour cast. If you can help it, try to avoid the colour cast. The other thing, don't shoot in bright sunlight. Um, you can shoot in bright sunlight, but there's a bit of an act to it. Um, and while you're building up your repertoire, it's probably best to avoid shooting in sunlight if you can shoot in the shade of a building or a tree or something like that. Much better to see. You'll have much more even light to play with. Um, and it, it it's just it's a little bit nicer. I think I did mention as well with reflectors, they the inner cores have um, like a translucent um, sheet. Uh, well, it's a ring, obviously, but it's a, uh, the sheet in the middle is just translucent. And if you get somebody to hold that in front of this between the sun and the subject, that will block out a lot of light um, and give you a consistent. Um, while they're in the shadow, they will give you a nice consistent light. So you could shoot them in the middle of bright, in the middle of a field, uh, in bright sunshine, as long as you've got somebody there to create the shadow for you with with a reflector. Um, and again, you use reflectors; they're cheaper than lights. Uh, I, I can't sing the virtues of reflectors anymore. They are just so useful. Um, I've got I even got one here with me at the moment, just to the side of me. Um, just to bounce a little bit more of the light back on that's hitting the ceiling back into my face because my big fat beard it makes my chin disappear into my shirt usually and my jacket um okay retouching is on the final leg now guys i promise we've not got much longer to go so retouching <clears throat> um three points really software color correction which we talked about and exposure with those three with with those two, last two things, you can create uh, yeah, a really good look 
for your um, for your uh, uh, your finished images, and it just takes them to that next level from that one where people look at the photo and go, "Oh, that was taken with the smart, that was taken with the phone." I could tell that was taken with the phone. Um, I avoid filters, and please avoid filters. Actually, it's a, a small plea. Please avoid filters. Um, and more, don't sh and definitely don't shoot with filters. It's always better to have a, an original copy. And then if in time you want to add filters, um, that's great, you can do that. Um, but um, I've had clients who I've delivered them good, accurate, colour fidelity images that they then slap a filter on, sell the product, and the product comes back because the client says it isn't the right colour. Um, so for you guys, colour fidelity is key. Um, so hence, I would say avoid filters if you can. Um, it depends on your aesthetic for your business. Um, obviously, you're all going to be slightly different. Um, but if you are shooting on your own and you want everything to be very high key, you obviously need to shoot with lots of light um, rather than trying to brighten the image afterwards. So that's that's a that's a point I hadn't thought about. I've literally just popped into my head just now as we're talking about filters. I mean, I tend to shoot on the dark side. It's not that I'm a fan of Star Wars or anything like that. I just, I've always shot with that darker shadows. I always like shadow. In fact, the image you can probably just about work out at the back is a really harsh image, raking light across the across the model just to uh, create texture in the um, in the garment. You can't really tell, obviously, on, on that sort of slightly grayed out image, but that was the whole point of shooting with that kind of look. So it creates that texture and um, adds, adds a dimension to the image. Anyway, let's see what we've got next. So the software, let's talk about the software. I've been a big advocate of Adobe. I've used Adobe pretty much my entire professional digital career, because um, obviously my original career started with film. Um, but since I've gone digital, then I've always used Adobe. I have tried other brands. Um, I'm less of a fan of them. Um, they all work very well. Often it comes down to cost beauty of Lightroom Mobile, which is available for phones and for, um, for your tablets, because it's free. Um, and it's really quite a powerful um, application. Um, so if you're shooting on your phone, you can edit on your phone and you can post it all off your phone. Um, you, don't need, you don't need another device even. Now, I've, I edited these on my tablet because it was a bigger screen for you guys to see what I was doing. Um, and I, th I, th I think as a software um, platform, that Lightroom is great. It's not to say the others aren't good. I just prefer this. And the beauty for me is it syncs in with all my uh, my PCs and everything. I often use, I often go down to London to do shoots. Um, it's usually businessmen, and I get back on the train. I've got an hour on the train, and I can I can uh, do an initial call. I can I can select images, do a color gradations. And by the time I get home, it's all synced up with my um, with my desktop and I can just jump on there, do the finished edit and it saves me a lot of time. So I would definitely suggest you check out Lightroom, um, even if you're not already using it. If you want to use the subscription service, and this does sound like an advert for it, and it, isn't, it generally isn't, I think it's about a tenner a month and you get Photoshop as well. But Lightroom is a really good platform. Highly recommend it. Colour correction. Now, we briefly mentioned this, um, and all light, as I said, has different colour temperatures. Um, fluorescent tubes, it tends to have a green side, so you need to put a more magenta purple into it to balance it out. Um, daylight is tend to be a little bit bluer, so you need sometimes need to put a little bit of warmth in there to balance it. Um, but if you shoot in the shadows, it's very much bluer. So again, you need to add slightly more warmth to, to balance that uh, balance that out. Um, spotlights, little downlighters in kitchens, that often, they often have a magenta cast, which is very odd. So you can imagine sometimes you go into, if you're shooting in a, inside somewhere and you've got more than one light source, the camera or the device can be really confused by what, what's happening. So you need to... Um, minimize the amount of confusion for it and um, that might be just switching off the fluorescent lights or if you've got sodium lights they're very orange um just so you don't get color casts i one of the images i took had got a really bad color cast on i couldn't work out why 
And then I realized I'd left the, the electric heater on and it's just like a glow, orange glow in this left hand corner. And I couldn't work out where it had come from. And it wasn't until I thought about it, I'd left the heater on. That's what the problem was. And that was on these shots that we were doing for, for this presentation. So, yeah, make sure you've got the least amount uh, of, of extraneous light coming into your into your set where you're going to be taking your photos. And exposure, light and shade. As I've already said, I like the dark. Um, I like highlights and highlights have to be crisp for me. Um, whites need to be white, blacks need to be black. Um, but I do tend to like a good um, uh, towards the darker uh, side on the images. Um, it's very simple to correct. It's one slider. You should be able to get it fairly accurate on, on the taking device. And then it's just a minor tweak when you see it in the software that you use. Um, so here we go. This is a live retouch. This is literally how long this took me. The photo is imported already, obviously, but then I re start retouching about now. This was an image that was taken on a uh, phone as well. Just minor adjustments, make sure the color colors are all accurate. That red is red. This is the color correction, literally done. Sometimes it has a bit of a fit and sends you a really strange color, but it doesn't do it very often. And if it does, you can just reset it. And then a crop. Nice, tidy, little, neat crop. Just to make sure the dress is all in. I'm less worried about the top of our hair. Just need to get the frock in. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Maybe just check the details. Make sure that color is right. It is right. The details, the buttons are good. And we're done. It's literally, that's it, less than a minute to do that whole section. Um, so when you've done your retouching and you're, I'm assuming you're gonna take my advice because why wouldn't you? <laughs> um, come to exporting. If you've got your, um, your ratios, so your aspect ratios are, um, most cameras work in three by, uh, three by two, some work in four by three, phones work in 16 by nine. Yes, yeah, 16 by 9. Um, so you that's how wide it is by how long it is. Um, in fact, I think I might even have got a slide somewhere with it. Yes, there we go. Show some examples of it. Um, my cameras are all three by two in the in the ratio aspects. Um, so I always export my image, uh, one of my images um, at its fullest, most original size that I can. Um, after it's been cropped, of course, um, if it needed to be cropped. Um, and that will allow you um, to have that permanent large image um, backed up and saved for you to use. You'll have the original image, obviously, but you'll have the edited image as well saved at its maximum size. So you should save it at 300 DPI, and that will give you a really good um copy that you could use for print or you could use on social media use it on your website um i also then save it to um and it usually gives you an option of like long edge at 2048 pixels um which is ideal for that's for your website and things like that um, but save it at 72 dpi because screens that's all screens can really render properly without getting too technical and boring about it because I don't really fully understand it. Um, and then if you know you're going to be posting it on social media or you, you want it somewhere else that needs it in a specific size, you can save it at that point in that specific size. And then you've got them all saved up, ready to go for when you need to, um, um, when you need to use them. Um, I find it best to do all my saving when I've just edited them and then I know I've got them and they're all ready to go. Um, the DPI, dots per inch, in case you didn't know, um, sometimes it's PPI, which has nothing to do with insurance, but it is to do with um, uh, pixels per inch. Um, it, basically, it's the same thing. 
and I always save an original format size and always save a web format size as well. Um, as I said, just, just for your own um, usage. And then you're not hunting back for files and re-importing files and exporting files again. It just gets a bit tedious. So have a plan as to where you're going to save your images. It's, it's basically a, um, and save them in secure places. I always save mine on a hard drive and in the cloud. I only save the edited images in the cloud because of space constraints. Um, and at the end of the year, I put all the files onto um, uh, another external hard drive and I save it in a different place. So I have, I have a box full of external hard drives in one studio and I have a box full at my house. And that way, in theory, I should never lose a file. It doesn't always work, but nine times out of 10. In fact, more than that. So conclusions, you'll be glad to hear this is the last bit. Um, keep things simple. Try not to make two things too complicated. It doesn't have to be as complicated as sometimes things can seem. Um, I've probably made it sound more complicated than it really is. It's just about being um, having a plan and being methodical. Um, consistency and repeatable across shoots. What I mean by that is if you decide, you know, if you've got four garments that you want to photograph now, but then for another four garments in eight months' time, you want them to look the same, have the same feel for the website, for your e-commerce aspect of things. You don't want to have to be either reshooting everything or having things look different. So it's keep consistent. Buying expensive gear, it won't make necessarily make you um, better images. Um, it might make them a little more consistent, but it's not essential to get you going. Um, collaborate, collaborate everywhere. As many people, as many different sources as you can. Um, it'll help keep costs down and you'll build up relationships going forward for different um, different shoots and things um, in, in the future. And practice. This is a thing lots of people, professionals aside, don't do. It's practice, practice, practice. I've been a photographer, 30, professional photographer, 34, five years-ish. Um, I rarely do, does a day go by where I don't pick a camera up and have a play, just shooting the cats and the dogs and the kids and the flowers in the garden just anything, keep practicing and keep it fun. I think that's about me, that's my details. So if I very quickly, just have, I'm gonna to have to put some glasses on here, I can't read this, um, have a quick look in the chat, see if there's anything that anybody wanted to know. I was know. gonna say, we did have a few questions come in, Nick, I can- uh, Ah, cool, can yeah, do you wanna fire them at me? Um, so we have one from Ismay who had uh, asked if you had any recommendations about using an SLR over a phone camera, i.e. using a RAW setting. Right, yes. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, that was something I didn't say, actually, yes. Um, RAW is better than, um, than JPEG in terms of having more information. Um, the raw file will literally have every single bit of information that, that was captured. So uh, a DSLR will definitely render uh, a better, higher quality image in the long run. Um, however, by the time you've, you've downscaled that to a JPEG to put it onto social media, you might have lost a lot of that information anyway. Um, and for going for, um, I think, I think a web designer told me, and you can probably correct me on this, they don't like files over one megabit, one, one megapixel, yeah, is that right? get those images down as small as possible for web, yeah. certainly as Google starts to use, you know, load speed of pages as a really important metric to determine search engine results. No, it, it, you want to be keeping your images on the website as small as possible. So if you're, so my advice would be, if you're only going to be using your images for, um, for the web, for anywhere you're going to view those images on a screen, then the prob there is a benefit, but it's mitigated by the viewing medium. Um, so if you if you're going to print anything ever, I would say definitely go with the DSLR. Okay. Um, I've got uh, a note I can see from Bav uh, saying any good places to get those from? I believe, I think that was about the time we were talking about the paper rolls and the backgrounds. Ah, yeah, any right. recommendations on where people can find those kind of tools? Um, I've bought mine, mostly I've bought them on, online um, from, I've literally, if you Google, Google photographic paper rolls, there's quite a few places come up. There's one, I think it's called Colour Roll or something like that, or Colour 
I can't just think what the name's called now off the top of my head. Um, they they were very efficient. They very often have three for two offers on. Um, they are quite expensive with the shipping. That's the biggest problem. So if you've got a van uh, or, a, or an estate car and you want a big paper roll, then find somewhere like Wex. Um, I know the nearest one to here is in Milton Keynes. Um, they sell them or will order them in for you. Um, and then you it mitigates the uh, the postage cost. Um, and th th I'm not sure if this one in Birmingham or not. There are a few photographic places around that do stock them, so you would just have to find out if there's somewhere local who could get okay. them for you. Um, but yeah, I've bought them online, and the background support systems I've bought though I've only ever bought them online. Okay. Um, I yeah, they start from about 25 quid and go to about 125 quid. Um, oh. And you do pay your monies and takes your choice a little bit sure. with them. So. Okay. Um, I can see a message slightly further down the chain from uh, Sarah, uh, who says, I'll be working with a photographer for my next shoot. He's an amateur but skilled. Can you give me any advice for directing the shoot without getting in his way? <laughs> it's quite um, a useful perspective, I suppose, actually, to get the photographer's side of it and find out, you know, what is a great way to to engage with that relationship from the other side. That's a, a really great question, I'd say. Actually, yeah, no, absolutely. No, um, I, I wish some people had asked me that in the past. Um, yeah, I, what I would, uh, what I'd say is, make sure before the shoot even happens that you've both got a really clear idea of what what sort of looks and styles you want to go with um so that pinterest board thing that i talked about earlier go th go on there and just google the thing the types of looks and things you want to um come up with and then make sure you're both on that same page um because there's nothing worse than you're both thinking you're on the same page and then actually you're at polar opposites um so that that's a, that's a really key point and um Find out if it's a tea or coffee drink on keeping well supplied. That's always a good point. Um, and yeah, I, I'd say as well, make sure you're getting what you want in terms of the images you know you want. Okay. Um, I know that probably sounds weird, but in my head, this is what, what I'm thinking. When, if somebody comes to me, I always make sure the client's got what they want. This is what I'm thinking. Um, but then when I've got those in the bank and I know they're good and that we're safe, I then say, you've got a few minutes. And then I then go off and do what I think will give them a stylish look, which is okay. a bit different. Now, sometimes, and it's happened, they, they absolutely detest my photo, my, my photos. It's funny though, how often they use their images on their website that they've, they've sort of like commissioned me to do. And then all of a sudden my images creep into their social media feeds sure. um, so i would say make sure you get what you want but give him a free reign to do his thing as well okay. but make sure you've got your stuff first okay cool and i've got i can see one more um just further down the list i think we've probably got about a minute before we'll need Ooh. to wrap up okay and, uh, yeah no it's good and let everyone jump over into jack's video session but the last question i can see here from bav uh, says any suggestions for going about shooting just product imagery over full model shoots is there anything specific you'd advise people think about in that situation um well you need to decide on whether you're going to shoot it tabletop um obviously i don't know what product we're talking about here but um if, say it's a shoe for argument's sake now are you going to shoot it on a subject or are you going to shoot it on a tabletop um and then you if you're shooting for example you're shooting on a tabletop are you going to shoot it at um looking down on it or are you going to shoot it at a three-quarter angle so there's, there's lots of variables um you can still use the same lighting setups that we talked about and the, the same lighting equipment the only thing i'd suggest is if you're going to shoot down onto something rather than shooting onto a paper i'd get a big sheet of uh, perspex in the color that is relevant to what you want so maybe a clear one or maybe a, a darker one if you if that's what you want okay um but yeah that's that's it's, it's a bit very specific things um it's very hard to sort of give in a general general presentation so yeah. so yeah so everything we talked about could be scaled back to handle a single tube 
Um, okay. It doesn't have to be a full body. I just did full body so to show you like the maximum capacity. That's why cool. I did it that way. So a lot of the same fundamentals will apply then. Just uh, yes. and, and be clear with what you're looking for and experiment to to, to get the yeah. right results. Exactly. What what I'd suggest is um, there are three variables when you're taking a picture. There's the camera, the product, and the light. They're your three variables. So if you fix your camera and fix your product, the only variable then becomes the light. So you can move your light to get the right look that you want to create. Um, if you can't do it with one light, add a reflector. If you can't do it with one light and reflector, add a second light. And just keep building and building and building until you get what you actually, the look you actually want. Cool. Okay, perfect. Well, Nick, I really appreciate you joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Really interesting. And uh, I know just from sitting here myself, picked up a number of, uh, bits of uh, useful nuggets as we went along. So hopefully Good. you guys that joined us did as well. Um, I'm going to uh, press the end button on this meeting for the time being now. Uh, and jump over and open up our video prayer uh, session with Jack. So hopefully you guys will see us over there uh, in a couple of minutes time. But Nick, in the meantime, thank you very much again. We'll thank you everyone for watching. Guys shortly. Thanks a lot. Hope you gain some insight. Bye bye.